um, Alyssa Miller. Um, she is going to be our speaker today. Alyssa uh, works at, in for Planned Parenthood in New York. She'll give you more background on that. She also worked as the state uh, public affairs director in South Carolina for Planned Parenthood, and she has a history with um, the Democratic Party, too, also having been the director of research for the Florida Democratic Party and deputy director of research for the Arizona Democratic Party. So a uh, range of research that uh, uh, she's had. So I'm going to just turn it over. I'm going to turn it on the
live in a state that is considered extremely hostile to abortion. More than half of U.S. women are reproductive age and in states that are hostile to abortion. You can see 38% of all these women live in a state that's extremely hostile. This is a state like South Carolina. This is a state like Arizona. 19% live in a state that's hostile, 12% in middle ground, and 31% that are supportive. It might surprise you, but New York falls into that middle ground to semi-hostile category because of restrictions in place that are aimed at, as I could say, supposedly making abortion safer, but in reality putting restrictions on it. New York actually legalized abortion one year before Roe but it still resides in the penal system, so the penal code. So it does not to health code, they require two or more doctors to be present for everything, they have a time restriction, and so even in states where you think women have easy access, they actually quite frankly still have to face systemic barriers. There are 41 states that require an abortion to be performed by a licensed physician, 19 states require an abortion to be in a hospital after a specified point in pregnancy, and 19 states also require the involvement of a second physician. These points are based almost entirely on ideology and arbitrary timeframes. The timeframes have been put in place, 20-week bans, my friend's latest six-week ban, 22-week bans, have no basis in science. They are done without the input of physicians, they are done without the input of medical professionals, or and not included in science. They are based on ideology. And in fact, the 20 week bans came into being because the pro life movement, or what we call the anti choice movement, took a poll and decided that 20 weeks sounds better to a focus group than 22 weeks or 24 weeks. So they didn't even bother trying to hide the fact that this wasn't based on anything other than what they thought they could sell to voters and to politicians. These restrictions, like having two doctors have to perform there to perform an abortion of enforcing licensed physicians also restricts the ability for qualified medical providers to be able to provide abortions. Forcing a licensed physician or someone who's board certified OBGYN to dispense the medication abortion means that a nurse practitioner can't provide it. This means that in many rural counties and in many rural states, we have people that may have access to a clinic that's 200 miles away and they may have a whole women's health clinic that has qualified nurse practitioners, but they're not allowed to provide the abortion pill. The abortion pill is where the, is how the majority of abortions take place. It's within the first trimester, it's two pills. You get one at the clinic, and then you get, take one at home. But 19 states force a doctor to be the one to prescribe that to you, not a nurse practitioner or a doula. 45 states also allow individual health care providers to refuse to participate in abortion, and 42 states allow institutions to refuse to perform abortions, 16 of which limit refusal to private or religious institutions. This has a disparate um, impact on low-income women and women of color. In many states, the closest providers are hospitals and institutions that are affiliated with universities, are affiliated with religious institutions, and oftentimes, University hospitals will not provide abortion because they receive state money, and the state has a provision that no state money can be used towards funding an abortion. And so that woman now has to drive somewhere, has to go seek care at a hospital that is somewhere else. We've had instances where women are coming into a Catholic hospital in the process of a miscarriage, and the Catholic hospital will refuse to treat her and force her to have a quote, natural miscarriage, and sometimes. Natural miscarriages don't necessarily end cleanly. You have to be seen by a physician. And they will refuse to see her because it's what they call an abortion. And so this can have a huge impact. This can lead to sepsis, death, and infertility. And those are, unfortunately, not extreme cases. 18 states mandate that women be given counseling before an abortion. And that counseling is state mandated. It is, again, no basis in science or fact, and it actually has been vigorously opposed by ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and the AMA, the American Medical Association. This state mandated counseling will include the reported link between breast cancer and abortion. This is mandated in five states. The ability to, for the fetus to feel pain, this is mandated in 13 states. 
long-term mental health problems for women who have an abortion, eight states, and um, the fat and infertility, eight states. So it should be noted that, again, none of this is based in fact. This is all ideology. These are all things that have basically been made up by anti-choice politicians. It's a way to keep our women from accessing care. And the most onerous of these restrictions are wait times. 27 states require women to have a wait time. These wait times can be any time of the day through 72 hours of most extreme. And these wait times are specifically designed to force a woman to travel twice to a health center. And if you're like me, going to a doctor's appointment means you have to take time off of work. And that means then two days you take time off of work. For low, again, low income and women of color and women in rural communities are affected disproportionately. I am a white middle class woman. I will always be able to get an abortion. I can fly to New York. I can fly to California. It doesn't matter. If you are a low income woman and the only place you can go to get an abortion is the health center in your town and you now have to come back twice in 24 hours and it's a 300 mile round trip, odds are you're not going to make that trip. These wait times have no basis in any reality. There has been study after study that has shown that women wait an average of 10 days between finding out they're pregnant and scheduling an appointment for an abortion. Women have thought about it enough. They have made informed decisions. They don't need to be forced to wait another 24, 48, 72 hours to fill some need from some male politician under the dome. This is all the legislation to ban some or all abortions from just January 2017 to March 2017. So as you can see, there are states out here you probably wouldn't expect to see. Um, New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. It doesn't matter where you are, women's health care is always on the chopping block. Uh, by July 1, five states had enacted six measures to ban abortions in some instances. 15 states have introduced measures aimed at banning abortions at 20 weeks post-fertilization which I highlight post-fertilization because that's not actually a medical term. Post-fertilization is, again, something that has been made up by politicians and anti-choice focus groups. It's 22 weeks last menstrual period. My biggest pet peeve is that politicians want to legislate reproductive rights and at least learn the language and at least get some basis in science. Because if you're going to regulate my body, at least use the right terminology instead of using what someone in the back room decided to hold. So this goes, though, beyond just abortion access. This, the attacks on sexual and reproductive health care are having really all of them with Title X and family planning grants have been some of the first things that have been cut and have been cut repeatedly and attacked on the state level. Um, abortion opponents have mounted a sustained campaign aimed at, public fam uh, aimed at denying public family funds from from providers who also offer abortion services. Title 10 is the nation's only family planning program, and it is the nation's only family planning program specifically designed to serve low um, income women and families. So here I have some, just some facts, you know, graphics on Title 10. I think, you know, Title 10, it's, again, it's the only family planning program outside of Medicaid. And what you'll see here, though, is that most clients served by the entire 10 support clinics are poor, but few of them are actually covered by Medicaid. And so Title 10 really is a stopgap, and it's something that's so important. There are over 4 million people that rely on Title 10 annually, and 80% of those fall below 150% of the federal poverty line. These are our patients. In 2015, Title X provided 800,000 PAP tests, 1 million women with breast exams, and 6 million STI tests. Title X does not pay for any abortions, but it does provide for comprehensive contraception education and birth control, as well as well women exams, life-saving cancer screenings, and STI testing and treatment, including HIV. It also saved the taxpayers an average of $7 for every $1 invested, and has saved federal and state governments over $13.6 billion. This money comes from having to fund unintended pregnancies, treatments for STIs, STDs, and other health-related emergencies. So, 
So, states that have adopted restrictions for funding for family planning providers. I'd like to highlight the fact that these states have enacted these restrictions only since 2015. So, eight states since 2015 have enacted measures specifically geared towards cutting Title X, teen pregnancy prevention, and other federal and state family planning funding from private abortion providers, private sex, uh, reproductive providers, and Planned Parenthood. So this isn't just an attack on Planned Parenthood, this is an attack on anyone who provides coverage of reproductive health care. In Arizona, the people that are affected are Planned Parenthood and private reproductive health focused providers, and the way they did that is by attacking Title X. They are seeking to control federal resources and block funding to affected providers by tearing out the resources. What this does is it says, we're not cutting Title X, we're just tearing out the system. So they put the fifth Planned Parenthood and anyone that provides an abortion in the bottom tier. So that way by the time all the money is distributed, there's nothing left. Arkansas, abortion providers and affiliates, entities providing abortion counseling and referral, and they've blocked all state funding and federal grants, as has Kansas and Kentucky. Michigan has done the same with just state funding. North Carolina has done the same. South Carolina has done the same, as has Wisconsin. Federal landscape, and this is where things really get wrong. Um, and I can say that entirely sarcastically, I don't know if you can pick up on that. Um, but for the past eight years, the states have really been the ones that waged the all-out war on women's and reproductive health care because they knew that at the federal level, if they tried anything, President Obama would be that stopgap. He would be, you know, anything harmful that came his way that might affect the women of this country. However, last November, everything changed. Women are now facing a hostile federal government in addition to state capital capitals that are quite frankly open on restricting access altogether. These access, these attacks on access have come in many forms, some obvious, some hidden away, and they all have nothing to do with health care. The federal government has been systematically chipping away at access since the beginning of this year. And quite frankly, women's health has been in crosshairs since day one of the Trump administration. First thing, expanding Mexico City policy. This is what you might know as the global gag rule. Uh, one of the first executive orders that Trump signed into being literally one of the first things he did his first day in office. So one of his first orders of business was enacting and expanding the global gag rule, also known as the Mexico City policy. What this does is it prohibits any entity that receives money from the United States from referring, from talking about, from providing, from educating about abortion in any way. So it goes, this is now goes beyond, it includes language about contraception. It includes forms of contraception. So a doctor cannot even talk about abortion to someone that comes in. Can't say, you know, can't even, even if she's like, I'm thinking about an abortion, can you tell me what the potential dangers are? Can't even say that, can't refer to it, can't, you know, can't provide it. It's a gag order on physicians and care providers. One community health organization in Ghana saw a 50% rise in women seeking treatment for complications from unsafe abortions after the this gag order was introduced. It was first introduced under Reagan, it was in place um, until Clinton, it was obviously pulled with him. <coughs> And then it was reinstated with George W. Bush. It was, the global gag rule is basically like a tennis ball. Who's ever in the White House revokes it. Who, uh, if they're a Democrat, who's ever heard a Republican is, they reinstate it. It's really, quite frankly, a disgusting manner in which um, U.S. government plays politics with the moral health care of women. This one, though, encompasses the list of everyday about abortion plus, uh, and it's an expansion that's wholly unprecedented. It is going to include programs which address HIV AIDS, maternal and child health, CEPA response efforts, and other health and disease areas are now going to be affected. And it's honestly setting back years and years that we have gained footing 
in some of the most poor areas of this nation, of the world, and some areas that have not had access to health care in years. Planned Parenthood Global doesn't currently receive any of the federal funds, and so we will use resources. However, the International Planned Parenthood Federation and its members do receive funding, and will use substantial resources as a result of this policy, but frankly, we expect to see some of our international health centers close. Even health centers that don't provide abortion because they're affiliated with the National Planned Parenthood and so we cut off the funding. But this policy, as I said, was last in place, 50% rise just in Ghana in one area. U.S. planning, U.S. assistance for family planning and reproductive health programs for 2016 would ensure and would have ensured that 27 million women and couples would have uh, been provided contraceptive services and would have averted 6 million unintended pregnancies, 11,000 maternal deaths, and 2.3 million abortions, the vast of which are unsafe. There are 225 million women in the developing countries who want to avoid pregnancy or are not using uh, modern contraception. Each day, 830 of them die from pregnancy or childbirth related complications. And each year, tens of thousands die from complications as a result of unsafe abortions. And so, by cutting funding and by exclusively singling out women's health care services, the U.S. government is saying that they are putting politics and the politics of anti choice above actual people and the well being of women around the world. Uh, it should be noted that this global gadget is in the American Defense Unit. There exists already something called the Helms Amendment, which prohibits this global dollars from being used for the provision of abortion. So this is really just, again, going further than what's necessary and doing something to appease a base than doing something to score what looks like a political win. Title 10, or as I like to say, by the means we're office. One of the first pieces of legislation that the U.S. House voted on was an Obama-era rule intended to protect state funding and state entities um, from a tax on Title X grant funding. This rule was meant to reinforce that it was against the law for extreme politicians to block uh, people from accessing care at their provider of choice, including but not limited to Planned Parenthood. The state purpose for this uh, the state purpose for this uh, was to prevent against really cuts to programs at Planned Parenthood and aims at restricting Planned Parenthood from participating in Title X. Planned Parenthood plays a huge role in Title X, even though we make up just 10% of the health centers that are funded by Title X, we see over 36% of all participants in the Title X program. And so by removing us from Title X, you're removing access for a huge chunk of people who are desperately in need of those services. Title X has been and always will be an essential component of health care. In 2010, which is the most recent year that statistics are available, Title X providers provided prevented 87,000 preterm and low, -term, uh, low birth rate births, 63,000 STIs, and 2,000 cases of cervical cancer. This is especially important in rural counties and rural states like South Carolina, where maternal mortality is at a rate that's equivalent of a third world country, and overall maternal mortality in the United States has been on the rise. Um, this is particularly shocking because we like to claim that we have the best health care in the world, and I think we've all seen that during the you know, health care debates, but we are losing when it comes to preventing maternal and maternal mortality and morbidity, and we're seeing those statistics rise, and we're particularly seeing those statistics rise where attacks on women's health care have been repeated and ongoing. <coughs> ACA. Hooray! What the ACA did is it removed any uh, ability for insurance carriers to um, basically deny coverage based on a pre-existing condition and disabilities were in those as pre-existing conditions. Um, and so, because the ACA is still in place, we are still, insurance carriers have to cover people with disabilities, and we also had Medicaid that wasn't done. And so part of that is saving Medicaid and ensuring that Medicaid still exists in its current form to protect those who are on disability and to protect those with disabilities. Um, and then the ACA still exists in order to 
to um, ensure that you can get covered even if you have a pre-existing condition. One of the pre-existing conditions that insurance carriers like to impose was if you had a C-section, that was a pre-existing condition. If you're a survivor of domestic violence, that was a pre-existing condition. I know that we had a, you know, a, a trite phrase saying if you're a woman of a pre-existing condition, but unfortunately it really came from a place that was real. Um, being pregnant is a pre-existing condition, breast cancer survivor, pre-existing condition, any kind of cancer survivor, pre-existing condition. Um, having a disability was a pre-existing condition. And so saving the ACA did more than just save coverage for women, it really kept coverage for everyone. Um, I have a lot of slides, like I said. I, I'm going to skip some, because we can go through defunding, and if you have questions specifically about defunding, ask me, and I'm happy to share this presentation. Uh, but one of the things I think is more important is birth control. Right now, um, there is a new rule that's been enacted that, it, that removes, uh, that if there's an Obama era rule that ensure that no matter what, even if you went to school at Notre Dame, your birth control would be covered even if Notre Dame didn't want to cover your birth control. There was an accommodation that was made for the school, but then the federal government forced insurance carriers, insurance, insurance companies to still provide that birth control coverage. The Trump administration issued an executive order rolling back that rule, which basically means anyone can stop covering birth control it doesn't matter if they're religious, there's no, you know, no more of that. And insurance companies are not required to still cover it. So what we saw happen with Notre Dame, Notre Dame immediately was like, that's awesome, we're not gonna cover it anymore, and now no one gets it. The students and faculty protested, and Notre Dame eventually backed up. Um, taxes. I bring this up because the tax fight is our next really, really big fight. And if you haven't already called your senator, please, please do. Um, the House just passed a tax bill that included language banning abortion. Um, I, I'm not kidding. They included language that would that uh, said life begins at conception and it allowed a unborn child to have open a 529 savings account for college and used language that would prevent people from having an abortion. The Senate, at the urging of Trump in their version, has included language that would get rid of um, the individual mandate, which is the backbone of the ACA. So not only are they restricting abortion through taxes, they are trying to repeal health care through taxes. And so if you haven't called, please call, because the House bill already passed. Yes? Um, I always get emails from like PPAZ to call the senator. Um, is, are those calls used in like in court as like this many people pay for members? Yes. Or for, like situations? Like, yeah, ab absolutely. So we definitely, so after the ACA, we actually tracked how many calls. And we had over a million calls. And so we'll track how many calls, how many calls specifically in you know, one state and look to which senator. And it's something then that will send Senate offices after the vote, especially Senate offices and House members that voted, quite frankly, the wrong way. Um, and so, you know, like I said, this bill, it passed the House. So the House bill has passed. They're now waiting for the Senate bill to pass, and that bill will be up this week. Um, so please call. It is quite frankly just the worst bill and why not with the house and you're going to be allowing unborn children to open up savings accounts and yourself can't open up while at the same time you're getting your health care rolled back without any uh, replacement in sight. So HHS, um, I would know. Just don't, I know Health and Human Services, we came to rely on them. They're, you know, they give out Title 10 they give out sexual health, you know, information. They're where you find out about if there's a new, you know, super STD. There is gonorrhea. Um, gonorrhea is no longer treatable in some cases. Um, and just don't anymore, quite frankly. They would point you to all their top positions, anti-choice, anti-women's uh, spokespeople. In one case, they have 
uh, a woman in there who is in charge of distributing funds for contraceptive services, and she believes that contraception in no way prevents unintended pregnancy, and that contraception will eventually sterilize you. Um, they also, on their website now, um, say that the most effective form of birth control is the rhythm. So, <laughs> just, you know, um, <laughs> I'm happy to go into it on each individual person. I feel like it's a <coughs> list. Uh, I just, you know, they're just the people I email every single day asking them why. Uh, if you haven't already done so, and you haven't, and you're looking for a way to get involved, even though I work in New York, we work really closely with affiliates around the country. And the plant here in Arizona has been doing, quite frankly, amazing work. Um, and so I encourage you to go to their website, sign up, and get involved. They are absolutely phenomenal. They're doing stuff locally all the time, and they need help here on the ground. Yes? I'm going to say April, and I'll be honest, uh, all for our base model, they've been very good. They've helped me with my work. And then I moved to Arizona, and they went to Arizona, and they don't, like, they do cost me $100. It depends on each affiliate, and so Planned Parenthood employs a sliding scale of cost sharing, and it's done to try and minimize the cost of those on people that may not have insurance. Um, what you should, what you can do, is you can ask them for the, for the sliding scale, portion, and that you'll have to fill out some things like your occupation and everything. But then what we'll do is they'll make the adjustment for your income. Um, and we do that at every affiliate. It's just done differently in each affiliate. Because each affiliate, you know, we have the umbrella work, and then each affiliate is really their own entity, all of the play here. Yes? Be sure to repeat some of these questions. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, wondering about accessing birth control between different affiliates. One affiliate did it differently, one affiliate uh, did, did it, you know, here in Arizona, it does it a different way. Um, and so, that's where we start my presentation. Like I said, I could keep, quite frankly, I have a really long presentation and I forgot how long it was. And I think it's because I get caught up in, holy shit, there's been a lot that's been happening and it feels like it's never ending, losing its stop. Uh, and I know that's how you feel right now. And so here's the fun part where now you get to ask me questions and kind of let me know what you're thinking after seeing everything that has been happening. And quite frankly, not even ever. Do you think people just don't understand exactly what's going on and this reason why the government's able to make all these changes? I, I, I caught the beginning and not the end. Do you think that's why the government's able to make all the changes? Because people don't understand? Like, or, like they're just not educated enough to fight back? Or what do you think the problem is that's allowing all these changes to be made? Yeah, I think it, I think that's part of it. I think that, quite frankly, a lot of what they do is done undercover and is done not out in the open. Most of the things that I told you have been done in a way that's, quite frankly, sneaky. Executive orders, hiding things in a tax bill, putting language in there, you know, appointing anti-choice, anti-women's help folks to HHS who don't need to be confirmed by the Senate, who they can just, you know, who someone who's not me may not realize. Um, at the state level, pushing through bills under cover of night in North Carolina, um, there was a bill that stripped almost all funding and attached a whole bunch of new regulations on abortion providers that they pushed at midnight and they tied it to a motorcycle safety bill. And they passed it because we had less than 24 hours to mobilize and how they attach it to a bill that has nothing to do with it. And so I think it's in part, people don't know what's going on, and that's intentional. Um, majority, Planned Parenthood and support for Roe v. Wade are the highest it's ever been. More people support Planned Parenthood than support either party, than support Congress, and support for Roe v. Wade has never been higher. And so the American people really aren't leaning anti-choice and aren't leaning anti-women's health care. When you talk to folks, they support access, even Trump voters, quite frankly, support access to Planned Parenthood. And so these are extreme politicians who live in a bubble within their own system and who purposely pass pieces of legislation in ways to keep voters uninformed. Okay. I'm a lot. <laughs> Not a good job. 
So I'm actually a pretty strong conservative constitutionist, and I follow this podcast, The Invention of Hero. And I feel like, you know, Planned Parenthood, what you're presenting seems all great and all, but there's also some facts that we don't we don't know about, like Planned Parenthood selling the to the high, selling the organ, the babies, the highest you know person to buy it. There have been videos leaked about that. How people have been selling that, people have been looking way to best squeeze the babies and kill them. I feel like I don't know what, what you're talking about doing that. Like the facts on Planned Parenthood is. 3,000 babies are killed daily, which is a million a year, which has since been past 55 million babies have been killed. So I'm really glad, I'm actually really glad that you brought up yeah. the videos from CMP. Um, because first off, they are not true. Uh, they, the videos passed by CMP were selectively edited and uh, were taken in an illegal manner. Um, also, I would like to, in terms of fetal tissue donation and research, every single person that decided that they wanted to donate the fetal tissue signed not only a letter, they knew exactly what they were doing. These, the, and in terms of where it comes to the selling, it's not selling, you know, body parts. It's donating fetal tissue that has been approved by the woman who has signed off on it to research for things like Parkinson's, for things like diabetes, for things like any number of diseases and medical breakthroughs. And the money that's being spent, it's actually just staff time. And I can tell you exactly how it's done. When someone goes in, they start a timer for how exactly how long it takes. So if it takes three minutes to complete filling out a form, that's the staff time that it's filled. These aren't it's not selling field tissue, it's part of a donation system. And it's a very small amount, less than 1% of all Planned Parenthoods participate in the field tissue donation program. And it's something that has led to medical breakthroughs and has led to advancements in medicine on any number of things. It's very similar to what hospitals do when they look at um, umbilical cords and they look at uh, tissue cells from after birth as well. Um, in terms of, that was your first question, in terms of the number of abortions, less than 3% uh, of uh, Planned Parenthood performs 97% of every other service. Abortions make up less than 3% of everything that we do. And abortion is an essential reproductive health care service. Prior to abortion being legal, women were going to back alleys, women were going to basements, women were doing what we see happen in many other countries. They were going places where they ended up dying, they ended up becoming infertile, they ended up in situations that were completely unsafe. Making abortion illegal and shutting down the narrowed isn't going to stop abortion. It's just going to drive it underground again and it's just going to put women's lives in danger. But keeping abortion legal and safe and in places with trusted care providers like Planned Parenthood, we're ensuring that women have access to their best selves and their best future. Well, we still denying that we're killing human life. Like when, when is life to cross the blue? By week three, the baby starts to grow, the little feet starts growing, the brain, the heart starts to grow. False. <laughs> False. <laughs> That's actually not medically accurate. I just watched the video on Mention Hero. Yeah, Ben Shapiro unfortunately isn't a physician. Um, I know he likes to pretend, but Ben Shapiro fits into that ideologue mold. He fits into that mold. So how many weeks is it then? Is it false? Is it false? Is it false? Is how many weeks is it false? Is it actually live? A fetus doesn't start to feel pain until after 20 weeks because the brain hasn't fully formed. I know. Because we work with the American College of Obstetricians, the American Medical Association, and physicians on a daily basis, and everything that we do is based in science and fact and done with the women's health in mind, rather than advancing our own political ideology. So life is based on feeling, even though it's hard to brain. Life is based on it. You can what well, life may begin for for you in your mind however you want. It's not my business, just like it's not your business, to tell someone else their beliefs. And it's not your business, and just like it's not my business, to tell you what you should be doing with your life. I think if you're a strict constitutionalist, at the basis of the Constitution is the freedom to choose and the freedom from large government. Having large 
government and having a lot of government oversight is something that constitutionalists are opposed to. And so by increasing government intrusion into the doctor's office and into the bedroom, that's directly in violation of what someone who describes themselves as a strong constitutionalist should actually believe. No, I believe that. I just think we you should get up in the air what is life and what is not. So like, you know, as human beings come together and be like, okay, that is life and that is not life. Like, but yeah, I agree with what you're saying, but I feel like it's kind of like throw up. Okay, well, what but it is because, and I'll life. take one point, and then I know there's a lot of other questions. In the Jewish religion, life doesn't begin until the child has exited the womb and breathed their first breath of air on their own. In the Christian religion, it's different. So if we're going to start litigating and if we're going to start telling people what to believe based on only one religion, then again, we're in violation of the basic core values of what this country was founded on. Um, so, other questions. And I'm happy to So, um, so you're telling me that every woman that signs a waiver and everything like that, you know, for the abortion, they so they have in their mind that they're killing a potential human being, right? And also another another question: um, You think for someone to tell you that abortion is wrong is a threat to your uh, of just being independent of a woman being independent? What what can you tell me that? I think that. If you believe that abortion is wrong, I think that that is entirely something that you should believe. If that's what you want to believe, then that's what you want to believe. But I don't think that your beliefs should be imposed upon mine. And I don't think that your beliefs should determine, just like my beliefs should not determine, what you decide to do medically. So I may believe that you have to go get it tested every time prior to you having sex and you have to get verbal consent and you have to use a certain type of condom. But I am not going to write a law specifying that. I am not going to write a law that says before you can sleep with someone, you must go get tested and do a full panel of HIV tests and everything and bring that written with you to present to your prospective partner. Because it's not my decision who you have sex with, how you have sex, and when you do. Just like it's not your decision to determine if I keep a pregnancy or if I don't. These are personal medical decisions that should be made between the man, or not sorry, the man, the doctor, the woman, and if she so chooses, her, you know, her, the person of faith that she turns to. No one should be enforcing their beliefs on another based on their political preference or their religious belief, just like I should enforce mine on yours. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, would you consider, you know, the fetus, what you know, the baby, and their cells, you know, bunch of cells, your property? Then. I don't consider it my property, but I don't consider any human being or anything my property. I consider it my body. I consider that I'm making a personal medical decision, just as you make personal medical decisions every single day. I just don't think that women should be subjected to a different standard and held to a different standard in making their own personal medical decisions than men are. Their com women should have the same complete bodily autonomy that men have. Um, next question. Yes. I have a question about that question. But anyways, my question is that there is a difference between HIV and a, and a permanent illness that once in your body you can't get out compared to what you're comparing to now. And I'm just thinking there's a big difference here. You know? Yes, there there is. Um, I guess I don't know what's the question. There is a question. I, my question was like, you're saying that we don't have a different, you can't tell someone that um, has HIV to go get tested first or something? We can't, we can't mandate that. We can suggest it and we can tell people that it's in their best practices and we can encourage it. But right now there's no law written on the books that says prior to having sex you must go get tested for a whole panel of STDs. We can't, we don't, we're not litigating what people do before sex if you're a man. Why are we litigating what women can do after sex because of their gender? Okay, um, my other question is, people don't have time to read through all the books and 
all the stuff that people put that they throw in now from the cost of the things. We can't keep track of everything. So how is it possible that we know about this stuff unless someone else like you come up and tell us in the first place? I think that's, I mean, I think that's a really good point. I think mean, engaging, I think it's hard because there is a lot. So engaging like I am, but also getting active in your local community and you know, I think you know, a lot of people know more than they think that they do. There's a lot of really good websites available and resources. The Guttmacher Institute is an, is an incredible resource, um, and they can give you information on almost everything related to sexual and reproductive health, um, ACOG, American College of Obstetricians, and obviously Planned Parenthood. Um, you know, the resources are out there, but I understand that there's a lot. Um, but, and it takes time, and it takes a lot of kind of diving in. Uh, next question. Yes. Uh, so I feel like it's more of a partisan issue now. Maybe right? we'll decide it's like Democrats see it more as removing themselves from the body, but Republicans have created a perspective where you're just you know, taking the baby out and punching it out of the window. So how do you feel like should we remove it from politics? And also a second thing just the things. Why am I so shitty? <laughs>
position financially. They may not be in the position emotionally. It may not be the right time. We have women that come to us that are ending a pregnancy as they're escaping an abusive in a domestic relation, you know, abusive relationship. Um, in the cases where politicians have enacted bans at 20 weeks or more, an abortion at 20 weeks is takes place in only the most heartbreaking circumstances. These are pregnancies that are very much wanted. And the parents have found out that the child will not survive in most cases. And they now have the option of either continuing a pregnancy and finding out that the child may not live, may not live outside the womb, or may die in utero, or terminating the pregnancy with a safe, knowledgeable OB guide. And so women, as I, you know, the statistic of women take 10 days, that's a factual statistic. So women aren't just making, you know, some do make the decision right away, but most do not, and most take the time to think about it. And the range and the reason for abortions varies, and it's very personal no matter what. Even if it was an individual decision, you know, even if it was a decision made with family members, with faith leaders, or if it was a decision made in a day, 10 days, 15 days. Um, these are decisions that women don't take lightly. And the rhetoric around it has really been purposeful to make it seem like these are you know, women making flippant decisions and decisions that they're gonna end up regretting. 99% of women who are talked to after they have an abortion do not regret it. And they are confident in their decision, they are at peace and they are happy with their decision because they know they made the best decision for them and in most cases they're failing. Um, and so it's a very deeply, it's a deep decision and it's a deeply personal decision. And that's why, you know, someone like me and a lot of people who live here won't necessarily talk too much about specific instances because we don't know why everyone is doing it. And I don't want to impose my beliefs on, you know, and, and my reasoning on someone else and potentially negate or delegitimize someone else's reasoning. I've heard that in like this state, um, like when somebody goes through like the process of wanting to get an abortion, that they like make you watch videos and ask you a lot of questions and they feel really awful about it. Is that true? That is. Um, that not at Planned Parenthoods or legitimate health centers. Um, there's this type of organization called a Crisis Pregnancy Center or CPC, um, and they are specifically created to discourage women from having abortions, and they're also specifically created to encourage women to come to them. So they will often have a name like Women's Health Care Choices, um, and they will come up and they will build one right next to a Planned Parenthood or an ob gyn office. And they will offer free ultrasounds. Um, in some cases, these ultrasounds are not actually medically accurate and are not being done by a licensed ultrasound tech. Um, they will do exactly what you said, they will force women to, you know, women will come and ask about receiving an abortion and they will force them to watch medically inaccurate videos. They will tell them that they have a high risk for suicide, they'll become infertile, they'll be breast cancer. They'll basically use every single scare tactic they can to try and discourage women from having the abortion. In, extreme, in an extreme instance in Michigan, there was actually a woman who got held down to the exam table by the ultrasound wand. They would not let her leave. Um, we have had patients that go get ultrasounds at these places who have been told the wrong gestational age and they do this on purpose to try and time women out of their options. So they'll say they're either further along or not as far along as they are in order to basically try and trick you into thinking you no longer have the option of getting an abortion and that your only option left is you know, birth or adoption. Some of these places are legitimate. Some of them have real medical staff. Some of them will support with adoption and will support with other funding. Unfortunately, most of them do not. And most of them are created with that specific intent. Um, and a lot of them receive state funding. Like here in Arizona, here for instance. Yes. So um, I know that a lot of people, the argument is, you know, uh, if you have a baby and you're not gonna get an abortion, then you just give it up for adoption. Do you think that if people knew how hard the adoption system was and how many kids go on adopted every year, do you think that that would, you know, deter people from saying that, or do you like, do you think that is actually like a viable 
uh, you know other option for them because I don't I don't think that people will, like understand how how rough our adoption system is and foster care uh, you know just in general. I think that I begin you know I think that if for an individual making that decision if they feel that adoption is the best route for them I think that it is a viable alternative. Um, I think that if they don't feel that's the best route they should not be forced on them. I do think that not enough is talked about in you know with our foster care system not enough is talked about with the fact that millions of children go you know unadopted every single year and who are facing budget cuts to that system that a lot of quite frankly republicans are trying to force women into um in states in south carolina in a state that's incredibly costly to abortion and one of my favorite things to say is just to use it you know adoption that's the best way we actually had children die in foster care and it went uninvestigated um, how, I don't know, it was at least a dozen children died while in the care of the state and nothing was said about it. And they weren't investigated, nothing was done. And so these children were, were harmed and this system wasn't being held accountable. That's not to say that, you know, well, for I guess it's not to say that you know, something else should, there should have been another option just to try and you know, shed light to right now, you know, that's not, if it's the best option for you and that's the best option that you personally choose, then full support it. But it's something that does need to be talked about and it's something that quite frankly needs to be overhauled because it's it's a, it's a shame for this nation to have such a system that is quite frankly broken and that is also then used as a crutch by anti-choice politicians and used as kind of a throwaway term for what to do without any then real investment into the system. They're not investing using it as a way to say here's what you can do instead but they're unwilling to invest any time or money to making the system better to help the children that are already within the system and that may not be getting the care and the support and the love that they need right a lot of the same people that are pro-life and want you know adoption to be an option <coughs> don't don't support the programs that help children that need and all these things in their lives you know uh, food you know money is it actually an excellent point? Most of the pro uh, pro life politicians have voted against uh, reauthorization of CHIP, which provides meals to uh, low income children. And so, my feeling is you can't truly call yourself pro life if you're unwilling to fund the programs that are keeping the children who need the most care right now alive and healthy and providing them with the best life possible, the best path to Yes? Maybe the topic prior to this, which is and maybe more germane to this crew, is high school sex education classes. Um, I don't know what you all learned in high school and the programs that Arizona has and other states have, but what are your thoughts about high school sex education programs that would preclude or precede Planned Parenthood activities? I think that we need them. I think that uh, sex ed and the manner in which um, comprehensive, medically accurate sex ed has been rolled back is a travesty. I think that we are leaving children unprepared for um, leading to the rise of unintended pregnancies, the rise of STIs, STDs. We have contributed to the fact that a lot of children don't know what consent is. Um, sex ed needs to include not just information about sex, it needs to include a guide to a healthy relationship, and that includes consent, that includes looking and knowing what abuse looks like, and looking and knowing when you can say no, and know when something isn't right. And most states, unfortunately, have rolled back their medically accurate comprehensive sex ed programs, and it's a fight to get it back. Um, the most common thing we hear is that if you teach kids about sex, that's actually just encouraging them to go have sex. Um, when studies have shown in most states, the states that have the most comprehensive and medically accurate sex ed actually have the lowest instances of unintended teen pregnancies and STIs in these teens. Um, and so it's absolutely critical. Um, and it needs to be expanded on because we're seeing with everything we know on the internet and with everything on social media and people just putting their lives out there, we're seeing things happen all the time that we never faced like when I was growing up. I mean, the fact that, oh, you know, Kids, I just heard a story of a you know, 12 year old sending revenge porn around of their ex girlfriend. You know, being able, teaching something like the fact that consent also, you know, just because your girlfriend sends you a naked picture, that doesn't mean she's not consenting for you to distribute that to your friends. 
Um, and so sex ed needs to be taught, it needs to be medically accurate. It needs to be done in an unbiased way with the look towards making sure that kids and teens and young adults are armed with the very best up-to-date information. Yes? What age do you think of, would be appropriate for like sex, sex ed educational classes? Like really? 11? Yeah. Oh, like, I think middle school. We got sex ed when I was in so middle school. Repeat the question for me. So uh, the question was, what age do you think would be appropriate to start teaching sex ed? Um, I think 11. I think that kids are getting sexually active, they're getting curious, younger and younger these days. Additionally, we also start giving kids the HPV shot at 11 years old because we know, you know, we know that that's the best age to vaccinate against HPV. So as we're arming kids against cancer, why not also arm them and give them, start giving them the best information? It doesn't have to be the same sex that you give a 16-year-old, but it can be something like, your body is changing, it's okay. You don't have to be ashamed that you got your period in class. And making it so girls aren't feeling like they need to hide their tampon up their shirt sleeve, they're feeling empowered because they know what's happening. And they also feel empowered to talk to an adult. They feel empowered when someone's bullying them. Boys feel empowered when someone's bullying them. I think that you know we need to start young and then you scale it up to what's age appropriate and medically appropriate. Any other questions? Sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, oh, I just uh, was wondering if, you, uh, you, I know you have that website right there, if you had any other uh, websites that you think are important to let us know about regarding to what we've been talking about. Um, yeah, so uh, the Kuhlmacher Institute um, is an incredible, incredible resource guide to knowing your rights, knowing what laws are in place, and also ways to be active. Uh, the Center for Reproductive Rights is very similar. Um, human Rights Campaign also has a lot of ways to get active, and it's really important um, for laws that are affecting our, our trans youth. Um, the Planned Parenthood Arizona website in general has ways to also volunteer and get involved, and also has information on health questions. Um, Planned Parenthood National, our national website, always check there because we have a lot of actions taking place at the federal level. Um, Bedsider.org is a great, great website. Um, they have been on the forefront teaching about consent and contraception. Sister Song is a great, incredible organization, absolutely incredible organization that is based on the communities of color and has been a leader in the reproductive justice movement and really in educating and really getting out and helping um, communities of color, lower income communities, and places that may not have access. Um, and you know, I'm happy I can provide the list to your teachers and you know, <coughs> compile them. But there are, you know, Planned Parenthood is just one of a coalition that's doing incredible work to really try to protect rights and advance sexual and reproductive health and ensure that everyone, no matter what your decision is, no matter what your belief is, has the ability of self determination and making sure that you can make for yourself the best choices possible. Thank you. So, any other questions? Sorry, I know I like migrated a lot. So I'm just going to ask one more um, question, and that is the um, you talked about the fact that Planned Parenthood does a lot of other things, but you were telling me at one point about STDs and what's been going on at college campuses, and um, and maybe you know that. Can, and then I know that there's this whole display back here yeah. for people if they're interested in information or water bottles, um, or anything else, there's some of this stuff. But maybe, uh, if you don't mind sharing this, though, I know we only have a couple minutes left. Okay. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, I don't know, in addition to obviously all the services we provide, um, education is a really key component. Um, and one of the things we've really been trying to do on college campuses is educate just beyond the bedroom, and that you know, goes beyond you know, making sure you have the right contraception, making sure you're tested, but to also making sure you know um, what consent is. Um, and so in terms of STDs, one thing we are seeing is we see unintended pregnancies decline, which is phenomenal. Um, and we can directly attribute that to the wide array of contraception available. Um, in states where contraception is not readily available, we've seen those rates 
increase, but nationwide the trend is that uh, unintended pregnancy is on a decline because of the increased access to long-acting uh, removable contraception, the LARC, which is IUD, um, the implants, the shot. Uh, but we have seen STIs on the rise. Certain college campuses, unfortunately, have their own strains of STIs um, and STDs. And this is in part because, as you, know, you mentioned, sex ed. We're not we're teaching kids. We're so worried about people getting pregnant. We're not teaching people that you still, even if you're on birth control, you still need to wear a condom because you need to prevent against everything else. It's just as important to keep yourself healthy as it is to make sure that you are determining when and if you want to have a child. Um, that goes for you know, men as well. Always, you know, always, always, always get tested. Always, always, always use contraception, no matter what kind of sex you're having. I don't care. You know, I don't care what kind of sex you're having. Make sure you're safe. Um, that is safe sex. As we like, we like to say, safe sex is the hottest sex because you come away from it the next morning knowing you're protected and knowing if you want to do it again, you can and you're fine. Um, so. Really, really, you know, it's a big, been a big thing for us. Again, also the consent is sexy campaign. Always get verbal consent. That goes for men or women. I don't care if you're a girl and the guy is drunk, drunk, get verbal consent. If you're a guy and the girl's drunk, get verbal consent. If they're not drunk, get verbal consent. Um, just because it looks like she's into it isn't enough. Uh, I mean, as you mentioned, we're seeing and being shooting, you see a rash of you know, women coming forward and talking about sexual harassment and sexual assault that they've suffered. Um, and part of the way we've been trying to combat it has been encouraging both men and women to recognize what assault looks like and what consent looks like. And that's been a big part of what we've been doing for education on college campuses. Um, just always, at the end of the day, Keeping yourself safe and keeping yourself healthy is the most important thing you can do for your sex life. Period. That's, that's really the best thing you can do for your sex life. Keep yourself healthy, keep yourself safe, and then go ahead and you know, 